So if you've got Bibles, now would be a good time to open them up to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 10. 1 Corinthians, chapter 10. Uh, if you are new with us this morning, if you are a guest, uh, we wanted to say thank you. Very glad to see you here today. And uh, what we're doing right now, just to catch you up to speed, is we are in a sort of an extended teaching series in the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, as you can tell, we've already made it all the way to chapter 10. And it's broken up, uh, kind of as we see, into sort of five major sections. And I think this is the third or the fourth one. I can't get my wires crossed sometimes. Uh, but we've been studying, kind of in the month of July, sort of a running theme of freedom and responsibility in the book of 1 Corinthians, in, in the section that we've been in. And we've seen a number of things, particularly that when we, um, when we come to Jesus, when we say yes to, to the salvation that only Jesus Christ can give to us, that a number of different things happen. One of those different things is that we are free from the bondage of slavery and destruction and death and brokenness. That that is a free gift. It's freedom. We have freedom from that sort of just kind of problem with a, a connection. We don't have to live lives that are broken anymore. Today does not have to be like yesterday. That we don't have to go on living in ways that are harmful and destructive and sinful and broken. But that God, in fact, and through Jesus Christ, invites us to a different and more free way to live. And, but with that freedom comes an interesting sort of caveat. Because we have all sorts of, we would say, freedoms. We have all sorts of different rights that we might exercise, but there are points at which it is not helpful, it is not beneficial to actually exercise those freedoms. There are points Paul has been showing us in the book of 1 Corinthians that we actually pull back, that we um, put sort of a, 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 I guess maybe a little bit of a damper on some of the freedoms, because there are points at which the exercise of our freedoms may be not only not helpful, but may also potentially be harmful to somebody else's relationship with Jesus, whether that person has met Jesus or not. And so those are some of the things that we've been exploring. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to pick that theme up, and we're going to finish it off before we move on to the next section in the book of 1 Corinthians, which we will start next week. So if you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we will be starting in verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. Now, by way of sort of further introduction, I want to say that sometimes I find it very helpful to self-evaluate. I find it very helpful to not simply just continue along the paths that I'm going as just a human being and as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, but there are points at which in my life it's very helpful for me to stop, take stock, and assess what it is I'm doing, why it is I'm doing it, and where it is I think I'm supposed to be headed. Would you agree that this is probably a wise practice? Self-assessment, self-evaluation. Am I, is, is this the right path? Do I need to course correct? And one of the ways that I find very helpful to course correct from time to time is simply ask myself a number of questions. And so, uh, you know, if, if you are a regular here, one of the things that you will know that I, I do as sort of general regular practice is that with each of the sermons, I'll end the sermon with a number of questions for reflection. And we'll be doing that, of course, again today. But we're also today going to be shaping and framing the entire message in terms of three important questions questions that we're going to draw out from the text as we read it. So I want you to be aware, if you're a person who likes to take notes, we do have a note section for you in our bulletin that has the questions for reflection printed for you at the bottom. And uh, if you would like to do that, you are free, yes, I suppose, to, uh, to do that as we carry on. So let's go ahead and read our first section, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to read verses 23 <coughs> through 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through 26. He begins and he says, All things are lawful. And I want you to notice that that's in quotation. 
quotation marks. You might be in the center of your Bible that way. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, again in quotation marks, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof will stop right there for the moment. So the question that I want to, uh, the first of the three questions that I want to draw out from this particular text is, my freedom, in terms of my freedom, the freedom that I have in Jesus Christ, and my exercise of it, does it benefit others? That's your first question. Does it benefit others? When I live in the freedom that Jesus has given me, do I live in such a way that it is a benefit to others? Because typically when we think of freedom, the freedom that I have, it's usually about my benefit, is it not? Well, I am free to do this, or I am free to not have to do that. And so we usually frame that in terms of, well, what is for my own best good or benefit? But Paul, in this particular section, would have us approach that in a very different manner. It isn't simply about me. It isn't simply about what is for you, for your good, for your benefit. But how do I live the freedom that Jesus Christ has given me through his death, burial, and resurrection on my behalf? How do I live that in a way that it is not simply a benefit for me, but is a benefit for other people who are around me? And so he'll use two words in this section that we've just read that will probably be helpful for us to draw out this idea. The first word is helpful. Helpful. Is it helpful? What is help? Help is when you come up alongside somebody and assist them in doing something that they cannot do on their own. I think particularly here of the book of Genesis. Okay, this is like the first human relationship, because it's the first human beings. When God creates Adam, when God creates man, he looks and he says, it is not what for the man to be alone. Good. It's not, for exactly, it's not good for the man to be alone, but I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that the woman, when God created the woman, was a mousy, quiet, little assistant. That's not what that word means. In fact, the word that's used for helper in that particular text is also used of God himself when he rescues and redeems his people. It is something that the people cannot do, and so God, of course, must step in and help. Same thing is true of Adam. When, Adam, when God created Adam, he was not self-sufficient. God said, that guy, he needs somebody. I can't just leave that guy by himself. <laughs> Which is pretty much true of all of us men. Is that not true? This past week, my wife and children were gone for an entire week. I had the house to myself wow. the entire week. Do you think I probably ate the way I should have? <laughs> <laughs> the answer to that is no, negative. I did not probably, in the best way, follow a dietary thing that would have been the most, because it is not <coughs> good for the man to be alone. It's not good for people to be alone. It's not just about men. Yes, I got it. That's true as well. But it is not good for human beings to be on their own. Why? Because, thank you for asking, <coughs> why? Because we simply cannot do this alone. Why? We simply are unable to do life on our own as God intends for us to live life. We don't have, that's why God created things like the church. He gave us community. He gave us people around us so that we could be helpful to one another. And so this is the first of the words that we encounter here in this text that, that help us to 
help others by pointing out it's not good for us to be alone. It's not good for us to be on our lonesome. It's not good for us to be by ourselves. It's not good for us to try to strive and live life as this sort of crazy, mythological, rugged individual that our culture probably in some ways tells us we ought to be. We ought not to be that. We are not made to be that. Yes, of course, there are individuals whom God has greatly gifted, but I am telling you this, they have not, whether it be in business, whether it be in church, whether it be in art, whether it be in whatever field that they find themselves in, people who excel only excel to some extent because of the people that are around them. A person who is a brilliant artist, like a musical artist, a recording artist, you don't know about them unless they have producers, unless they have other musicians. You don't know about them unless they have people around them supporting them, telling them, like, this is pretty good, you probably should share this with somebody else. Because we are not meant to be creatures who live ruggedly, individually alone. We are meant to be people who live together in community. And so we begin with this question, is, is my exercise of my freedom, my life in Christ, is it a benefit to other people? So he says helpful, and then he says he uses another phrase, a two-word phrase. Is it helpful? Does it build up? In my seeking to be a benefit to other people, am I able to build other people up? Now what this is about is, how am I helping to, you could say, facilitate the maturing process? Every human being develops from the moment they are born until the moment they die. People develop, people grow, people change, people are not, I am not the same person as I was 10 seconds ago. Literally, thousands if not millions of cells in my body have died and have been replaced by other cells that are more alive than the ones that died because I am growing, I am developing, I am maturing. That is true on a physiological level, that is true on a spiritual level. I am not a person designed to remain statically the person that I am right now. Just because I am a pastor, just because I'm a quote-unquote professional minister, does not mean I don't have a long way to go. And the same thing is true of you as well. Every person in this room has a way to go. And we are meant to be continually built up. And that is also something that we do not get to do on our own. If you are a person who regularly finds themselves withdrawing, pulling back, staying away from, isolating yourself, what you are going to find is that you are not developing in the way that God intends for you to develop. God, of course, does give us moments where we do need to step back. God does give us moments where some silence and some solitude is really quite beneficial for us. But if that becomes the primary way we live and move and have our being, what we are going to find is that we are not developed as how God wants us to develop. We are not being mature. We are not growing. We are not becoming the person that God has for us to become. We are meant to be built up. And that means that we are meant to help other people be built up. This is not a self-project. This isn't something I tackle on my own. This isn't something I get to do in my spare time. This is a continuing, ongoing community project. You have something to contribute to my ongoing growth and development. I have something to continue, or to contribute to your continuing and ongoing growth and development. I assume that's part of why you're here. Not simply because, well, I guess we just always do this church thing, so we gather, we sing some songs, we listen to some guy talk for a while, and we sing some more songs, we give an offering, and then we just go home, because I guess that's just what we do. No, we do this because God desires for us to gather as his people and to change, to grow and to develop, and for us to help each other do that. This is why we do what we do in this room on Sunday morning, because any other time that we get together, whether it be in small groups, whether it be in 
worship practice, whether it be in serving, whether it be in helping in the nursery, whether it be in doing children's ministry, whether it be in driving a bus, whether it be in cleaning the church, whether, I don't care what it is you do, as long as it is done as part of a contribution to the ongoing community, the kingdom of God that is being built up in our presence. This is why we are here. So that's the first question. Does it benefit others? Does it benefit others? Let's pick up in verse 27 and read through verse 33. 27 through 33. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any level or any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but it is. For what should my liberty be, be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I being denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Now there's a lot of things going on here, but we need to parse through some of it and get down to the basic essence of what's kind of being driven at here until we come to our second question. Our second question is this. Does my exercise in my life and my freedom, does it glorify God? Does it glorify God? First question is, is it a benefit to others? Second question is, does it <coughs> glorify God? Is God the center of what we do? Or am I simply passing time and entertaining myself by doing this? Is this just about me getting my kick out of this? Is this about me getting my spiritual hit out of this? Or is God the center of why I do everything that I do, whether that be church stuff or non-church stuff? Is God the center of what I do? Do I seek to glorify, to give glory, to make sure all of the appropriate attention gets directed up to God? Rather than sitting and standing going, well, I don't like the way you did that. Well, I'm not comfortable with this. Well, this isn't, doesn't make me happy. It's not about you being happy. It's not about me being happy. This is about, God, are you pleased in this? Have we, have we offered, have we sacrificed, have we given of ourselves meaningfully, truly, and in the Holy Spirit? Have we worshipped, as Jesus said, in spirit and in truth? So that, God, you are pleased by this. Because here's the thing, God can be pleased by us. He can be pleased with us. Sometimes we get this impression or this idea that, oh, I'm so bad, I'm so terrible, I'm so broken that he could never be pleased with me. That's nonsense. He was so pleased with you that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And he can continue to be pleased with you. See, this, this God that we worship, that we gather here for, he adores you. He loves you. He enjoys it. When you do well, he really does. So are we seeking to glorify God in what we do? Is it a benefit to others, and does it glorify God? And there are a number of things that he says here. He says, give no offense. He says, give no offense to the Greeks, to the Jews, or to the church of God. Now, we hear the word offense. And we typically think of something that's offensive, something that makes us go, oh, right? Something that well, maybe somebody uses some language in our presence that we're like, oh, that's offensive. Somebody says something. Somebody does something that is offensive to us, and that kind of makes us go, oh, right? That's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about that sort of grade of offense. The word offense 
that's used here means something a little bit more like this. <laughs> stumble. Is this causing somebody to stumble? Is my action or my words causing somebody to trip up and not be able to walk along the path God has given them appropriately and well? Is the exercise of my freedom or my quote-unquote rights, if it causes somebody to stumble, if it causes somebody to trip up and fall, maybe to walk a different path altogether, I need to stop. I need to reevaluate. I need to pull back. And I need to say, maybe I need to go about this a different way. Maybe I need to reevaluate how, not just why I'm living my life. Not just how, or, but also why I'm doing my, the way I live my freedom in Christ. That I would give no offense to people, that I would cause nobody else to trip and to stumble and to fall. This is an, an, an essential and important question because if, we, if you really look at this idea of give no offense and connect it with the question that we've just asked, which is does it give glory to God? One of the things that we discover is that in our seeking to give glory to God, it does definitely matter how we interact with each other. This is not simply about how I have my own closet, quiet, personal relationship with Jesus. We compartmentalize way too much in this regard, by the way. It's about me and God. No, actually it isn't. <coughs> it's about you and God and God's whole people. It is about how we interact with everybody, how I cannot give glory appropriately to God if I am causing my brothers and sisters to stumble, or even people who are not my brothers and sisters. I am not able to glorify God if I am pushing people away from Jesus that have not yet met him. It totally matters how I live my life in regards to other people. So give no offense. Give no offense. <coughs> then he says, instead of giving offense, he says, I seek the advantage of many. Seek the advantage of many so that they may be saved. This is, this is the mission of God. And this is something that you're going to be hearing me talk quite a bit about from this point on is the mission of God and how we do, in fact, seek the advantage of many. This is not about how I have my own personal nice little worship experience. This is about how we set up everything we do as a benefit to the ongoing mission of God for the advantage of people, who, especially people who are not yet a part of this body of believers or any body of believers anywhere. This is our mission, to tell people and introduce people to Jesus, to seek their advantage, to seek the advantage of many, Somebody I may not be able to reach, you might. Somebody I may not be able to talk to, you might. Somebody you may not be able to talk to, I might. And it's not about, we're going to get into this after we're done with our series in 1 Corinthians, just to give you a heads up of what's going to happen next. After we get done with our series in 1 Corinthians, we're going to be doing a five-part series on our mission. We're doing a five-part series on our mission. What is our mission as the church? And then we're going to twin that with a, a second series that's going to sort of kind of belong in the same womb, I guess you would say, as the other series on uh, how we serve the mission. These are going to be the questions that we're going to be swimming in in uh, October and November. And then um, obviously we'll have December where we do the Christmassy things. And then starting in 2015, we are going to strategically approach our community 
with the mission of God, and we're going to start introducing people to Jesus like we haven't been to him. Because that's our mission. And because God has called us to his mission, and we get to participate, we have an unprecedented privilege as the people of God to share Jesus with people, especially because they have a desperate need. Yes to Jesus in our character. We learn how to say yes to Jesus in 
it. If there's anybody here, by the way, who has not said yes to Jesus yet, this would be a really good time to do that. This would be a brilliant time to do that, because here's the deal. All of us have been born, right? We're all here because we were born. I assume that's why you're here, at least part of your story. You were born, but every, the way every single human being has been born is that we were born broken and by the way from God. And you can see this very clearly. Turn on the news, read the newspaper, newspaper, go outside and watch people. You will see this brokenness rear its head in some form or another. It is undeniable. It's incontrovertible. It is simply there. People are broken. And some people hide it better than others, but we are all born this way. And because we were all born broken and bent away from God, every single one of us needed to be restored to God. Every one of us needed to be redeemed. And the only way that that happened is God himself came. He came as Jesus Christ. He lived a life completely unbroken and completely unbent away from God, but bent completely toward God. And he lived this perfect life, and he did miracles, and he taught people, and he drew people to God, and then he died for us in our place on a cross. He was executed even though he did not a single thing wrong in his life. He died because we all needed somebody to die in our place. Because this is what the scripture tells us. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you are here today and you have not yet said yes to Jesus, now questions for reflection, and then we're going to pray. If you would like to accept Jesus today, I would love to help you with that. And then you come see me afterward, and I'd love to talk, to you, talk with you more about what that looks like. So some questions for reflection first. Questions for reflection. Question number one. Print it for you in your bulletin if you're interested. In what ways can I regularly help and build up others? In what ways can I regularly help and build up others? a good self-evaluation question for you to ask today. How can I help and build up others? Question number two. Is God glorified by the way I live and the way I treat other people? Is God glorified by that? Observe yourself at your most alone moment. And this will be a good indication. Is God glorified by what I do and the way I treat others, or the way I treat myself, even. Because that matters, too. Third question for reflection. In what ways will I seek to become more Christ-like in character and conduct this week? In what ways will I seek to become more Christ-like in conduct and in character not good for me to 